Welcome everyone to the Damage Report on a fantastic Monday, the last Monday that I will be hosting the Damage Report because the host of the Damage Report, John Iadarola, will be back next week. Woo, 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 woo. And nothing bad will be happening. All the news will be sunshines and rainbows and lollipops, and um, we won't tell John a single thing, right? Right. Um, but that means it's my last Monday. With my favorite co-hosts, the wonderful, the great, the incredible Senator Nina Turner. Um, uh, Senator, welcome, welcome, happy Monday. Thank you, Francesca. And this is my last Monday as well. I'm sure we both will be on from time to time as co-hosts, but I'm kind of sad to see the dynamic duo in this way. I know, I know. They keep on ripping things out from underneath us. We'll make it up. Um, obviously, everyone. I have to get you on my show, The Bituation Room, the podcast, the show. So stay tuned for all that. Absolutely. Uh, it'll it'll be good. Um, but why don't we, look, we got some really serious and important updates um, from the Middle East, from Israel's war on Gaza. Um, we have a little bit of backlash of what's happening here as well as pushback. Backlash and pushback, they often go hand in hand. Uh, then we're gonna check in with the presidential race on the Republican side, what's going on? Uh, Ron DeSantis utterly just, just completely eating it, whiffing it. I don't know, getting owned uh, by the mainstream news, which is like, it's not really hard to do well in that interview. But anyway, he somehow manages to come off looking like an idiot. And then a little bit more on some updates from Maine and this country and the world struggle to rein in firearms. So with all that guys, you know what to do. Like the stream, share the stream, send us your super chats and your comments. I'll be reading those in the social breaks. The Those keep us going and thank you so much in advance. And with that, why don't we begin with this. So that was a young girl outside of a UN school in Gaza saying shame on Israel for bombing women and children and civilians who they're not warning before they bomb them. Shame on them for forcibly evacuating one 1.1 million Gazans, many of whom are not able to evacuate because they are disabled, because they are elderly, because they are paralyzed in fear. Um, this was a weekend of uh, dramatic escalation of Israel's war on Gaza. And it started um, on Friday night um, with a near total blackout in the, in the territory. Um, but this bombing campaign is so severe, experts are calling it one of the harshest of the 21st century. That is what we're dealing with. Um, the death toll as of this morning has been over 8,000 uh, people killed in Gaza, including 3,500 children. And um, as you heard there, there is a desperation as family members and people are under the rubble. Um, there has been repeated targeting of a hospital that many Gazans are actually sheltering at. About 14,000 people are sheltering as there are bombs dropping all around. Now, about this. Dramatic escalation, not a lot is known because of the cuts to electricity, which means internet, um, phone lines, in addition to, of course, the lack of fuel, um, the, the lack of electricity generally for things like, you know, lights and keeping uh, hospital generators on. Um, but Israel has not openly claimed responsibility for cutting off the electricity and the communications, cell phone towers um, and internet. However, this is from Mark Regev, who is a senior Israeli government advisor said, disrupting enemy communications was a standard wartime tactic. But stop short of confirming that it was intentional. In military operations conducted by the British Army, the American Army, Often it is standard behavior to disrupt the communications of your enemy. That was his quote. Um, what happened on the ground when those communications were cut, when Gaza was plunged into darkness? Um, Rushdi Abu Luf, who is a journalist with the BBC in Gaza said, since communications were cut on Friday night, ambulance drivers could not receive instructions. So they simply drove in the direction of explosions. Um, in case you 
needed any confirmation of how serious this is. This is being framed by Prime Minister Netanyahu as very much a holy war, um, very much an us against them. There is no sign of slowing down. He's called it, in fact, the second war of independence. Um, so that is, um, th- those are harsh words as many Palestinians are getting flashbacks of what their parents went through in 1948 during the Nakba when they were forcibly um, forced to leave their homes and never returned. Um, but here, here are some excerpts from Netanyahu's speech to give you a sense of the kind of language he is using. Um, He said this, he said, look, everyone will have to give answers, me too. But all of this will happen only after the war. In other words, don't come to me to ask me about whether or not we're being careful with civilian lives or not, whether or not we actually bombed Hamas targets or not, whether or not we're allowing international observers into the region. Mm-mm, now is not the time for questions. So he says, it is now a time to come together for one purpose, to storm ahead and achieve victory with joint forces in a profound belief in our justice, a profound belief in the eternity of the Jewish people. We shall realize the prophecy of Isaiah. There will no longer be stealing at your borders and your gates will be of glory together we will fight together we will win we will fight and we will win and this will be a the triumph of good over evil light over darkness life over death now he's ref, in terms of that sort of triumph of isaiah um, the prophecy of isaiah he's referencing isaiah 60 18 that says violence shall be no more heard in your land devastation or destruction within your borders you you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise um, which is very ironic considering There's a lot of violence in the land. And according to pretty much everyone who understands this issue, violence will not stop the violence in this land. Um, This is in addition to guys, you guys all know that there have been calls to for Gazans to retreat to the south. But over the past two weeks, Israel's ramped up airstrikes in southern Gaza, even demanding the relocation of hundreds of thousands of residents of the northern of northern Gaza to the south. So even after, excuse me. So right, so there is no safe haven. Um, and, and before we go to the what's happening in the West Bank, this is what the New York Times, again, there are very few details the Israeli military is providing them, but this is the map that they were able to sort of, based on footage, based on what they had, the reporting they'd seen, where Israel is starting, I don't know if we have this, where Israel is um, uh, invading, so to the north, Israeli troops. Um, they piece that together through strikes uh, posted Thursday and Saturday. Tanks and artillery are crossing into the border. Um, Israeli troops then down to the south. Um, this is again thanks to like strikes and videos of tanks rolling in. Again, this is a ground incursion as well as an aerial bombardment, and uh, it is not clear what the final goal is. But this is where we're at, and of course, the United States it has not officially called for a ceasefire despite the United Nations doing so. Um, Senator, your, your thoughts on just over the weekend, I mean, some of the things we were hearing and seeing or not seeing um, were quite chilling. Yeah, heavy heart, Francesca. I mean, you could see what the what our viewers can't see when the camera's not on me. I mean, I'm just exacerbated by this whole thing, numb. And I know millions of people are numb by this and it's people like us who are not even at the center of this pain we're ancillary to this pain at at this point the united states of america to our internal shame nobody nobody in the world is going to escape the fallout of what is happening in this war and to see that young girl in her exacerbation exacerbation over what she sees happening and how she's describing what is happening. And if she lives, right, to grow up, there will be a type of resentment here, right? There are gonna be resentments on both sides of this from Palestinians and also Israelis. And so the course of action that must be taken despite what the some of these spineless elected officials in this country is saying are saying is a cease. Fire. Now you do have some electeds who are standing up, you know, led by people like Congresswoman Cory Bush and others who have asked for the ceasefire, and we've had several sign on to this. But beyond that, it's very few in the Congress who will stand up to say we need to have a ceasefire. That humanitarian efforts must prevail. They must prevail. And Francesca, I just, I mean, it could be in either any of us could be an Israeli or a Palestinian. And what would we want the governments of this world to do to try to save 
innocent lives. That is not happening. And you know, something that Jeremy Corbyn put out in a tweet, Francesca, that I totally agree with. You know, we know we had that anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic mob, you know, show up looking for uh, people from Israel on planes. No. Absolutely not. Mob violence should not prevail in situations like this. But he went on to say the global rise in anti Semitism and Islamophobia is terrifying. Amen to that. Hatred does nothing to generate solidarity or bring peace. Amen to that. And lastly, in his tweet, he said, We cannot lose our common humanity in times of darkness. It's all we have left. Francesca, I question if there is any humanity going on at all. And the United States is particularly culpable in this moment because our government could do a lot to be a champion for a ceasefire, to be a champion of the reordering of things and to try the best we can as our lives, like our lives depended on it because they do, to try to find a humanitarian way out of this. And I get the debates of, you know, will Hamas cooperate? Will they not? Co- Got it. All of that. We, we get it. Mm-hmm. However, mm-hmm. how are we going to get to a solution that ultimately edifies and stops the senseless killings of innocents yes. without standing up saying that we must have a ceasefire. International laws are being broken and certainly humanitarian, uh, any measures towards humanity is being broken. And to have Netanyahu quote the Old Testament of the Bible, you know what, Francesca, I'm not even going to go there. You know, I'm a <laughs> Christian chick. I was raised up in the church. My mother made us go to church eight days a week. My siblings and I, I come from a black theological liberation ideology. And I tell you, the New Testament says something that is this different, but I'm not going to go there. I'm going to put that in the parking lot. This is absolutely horrendous what is happening in that region. And it could lead to the beginnings of WW3. Yeah. Where none of us, again, none of us, only all that we love is on the line here. We see Iran is talking about you know, red lines being crossed and everything. This, there's nothing to be played with. And so we need more leaders around the world to stand up. And as you said, Francesca, the UN has made it clear. So have other humanitarian based groups have made it clear about what is stake. And shout out to Jewish Voices for Peace. Yeah, we're they gonna look, we're gonna. Up. We're going to look at them in a little bit and, and all the actions that have been going around. But just to pick up on a piece you said, you know, this question of like, will Hamas cooperate? I mean, I think the real question is, will Israel cooperate? That's uh, it. Hamas, whatever you think of the organization, they have hostages and there are still people alive being held by them and they're asking for a prisoner swap. Now, of course, when you label and you say that they're terrorists, the next question is, do you negotiate with terrorists? And If the answer is no, then you have rendered those people dead. You have signed their death certificate right there. And so there are people also inside of Israel. This weekend saw massive protests and Israel was no exception, especially for the people who have loved ones who may very well still be alive. Um, and, and can we agree that to understand that these hostages are being held in tunnels underground and yet bombing civilians above ground? I mean, what more evidence do you need that these war crimes are going on? But uh, I did want to mention that there's been other violence in a place where Hamas is not, is not the military, is not, uh, excuse me, the the government. And that is the West Bank. Again, the occupied territories in the West Bank. More Palestinians have been killed in Israeli occupied West Bank in the past few years than in any similar period, at least in the past 15 years, according to the Palestinian health authorities and historical data from the UN. Israeli forces and settlers have killed 95 Palestinians in the Israeli occupied West Bank since the Hamas attacks on October 7th. So again, Netanyahu's bidding this, pitching this, okay, there's gonna be no more violence in the region. Well, what's what's happening over there? What's going on? What's going on with the settler violence? What's going on in, you know, arguably your territory? Um, So that's important to note. The assault on Gaza and the Palestinian people has not been without massive pushback and resistance, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Over the weekend, we saw millions come to the streets in London. Um, We have some footage from that right here. You can see just completely flooding the streets. There were folks in Istanbul as well. Um, So Turkey turned out massive millions of folks on the streets there. But then you had San Francisco. 
protesters in San Francisco shut down the 101 freeway, um, calling for a ceasefire. Uh, but truly, the the acts of heroism that we're seeing are being led by one group of Americans, and that is Jewish Americans. Um, Jewish Americans with organizations like If Not Now and Jewish Voice for Peace have been out in front calling for this ceasefire, um, saying that not in our name. Um, here is a little clip from Chicago, which had its own demonstration, and this specifically was one led by Jews in Chicago. Take a look. We are here doing as Jews in the Chicago community is to say that the Israeli government policy does not speak on our behalf and that we do not believe that the genocide of Palestinians in any way contributes to Jewish safety, either in Palestine or here. Right, so pushing back on the idea that Netanyahu is selling, I think a lot of Jews, not just in Israel, but around the world, that what they are doing keeps all Jews safer. Um, and I mean, if we've seen some of the rise in anti Semitic as well as Islamophobic attacks, I think we can all agree nothing about war makes anyone safer. Um, so, anyway, a fun double, double speak there. That was from JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace in Chicago. JVP in New York stepped it up a notch. Uh, they shut down Grand Central Station during rush hour. On a Friday, people, I don't think you can pick a more prime time to make your voice heard. Here was a photo of them outside of the station. These are folks who weren't able to get in because they were demonstrating in support outside. There were also past, excuse me, commuters who were like, what's going on inside? What was going on inside? Let's take a look. So they're calling for a ceasefire and there were rabbis among the folks, there were religious Jews, non-religious Jews, allies and supporters. I mean, that kind of action, it just sends chills down my spine because it makes me realize that look, we are not our leaders. We are not Biden, we are not Netanyahu, we are people, we have, we, you know, we know we bleed the same. We know we all have families, we know we all have dreams. And we're never listened to whenever it comes to war, right? You know, I remember Senator were out in the streets during trying to stop the Iraq war. Massive millions of mobilizations. You can still see those photos. Anyone listen to us? No. But we still got to keep hitting the streets and we still have to keep the pressure on inside of Congress as well as on the streets here. But, but your thoughts. Yeah, I agree. And that was such a beautiful sight to see of people standing up again for humanity. That's what it is going to take. And no, if, if imagine if America, if Americans and some, you know, world leaders have tried to do this when they disagree with America, but imagine if we were always held accountable for what our government does <laughs> in a way that, that hurts and maims and kills people. I mean, we would be in dire straits even in this country right to this moment. But definitely Jewish Voices for Peace and others who are standing up, they're taking the slings and arrows. They will be called not Jewish enough, not, I mean, we know what happens when a Jewish people stand up in that way or they're going against the grain, really going against a right wing government, the Israeli right wing government. And as you've laid out here, Francesca, and we have on TYT on countless shows, you know, many of the Israelis before this war started were calling out Netanyahu. I mean, I'm old enough to remember right. that. That wasn't that long <laughs> ago. And so to see people all around the world, but especially in this country, stand up for humanity, for what is just right and good is nothing. But I mean, it's just all I am absolutely in all of these people because they're doing it at great risk uh, yes. to themselves, both physically and also to their person and to their jobs. I know we're going to be talking about how people's jobs are being threatened and livelihoods are being threatened only because they're standing up for justice. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally, let's just remember that even Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has said there is no military solution to Hamas. So if there's no military solution to Hamas, what are you condoning? Why are we continuing to send weapons of war? Why are we continuing to not call for Israel to for some kind of restraint or for a ceasefire? If you know this will worsen the situation. Guys, the peace process has been dead for so many years now. The United States 
Biden has not tried to restart it. And again, just like in his border policy, has largely doubled down on Trump's pig headed, fascist, and very scary policies. So and we need a course just, correction. Just, just one more quick point. This is gonna build generationally. This this is not gonna end here. No. Other generations are gonna have to deal with the fallout of this. And I want people to wrap their minds around this as we think about what we should be promoting and pushing for. This is not just the physical lives on the ground, either in Israel or in the Gaza. This is about every single nation in this country will be impacted by this. And yeah. they will be impacted for many, many generations to come. It is not easy to speak out for Palestinian human rights at a time when Palestinians are being bombarded by Israel and supported by American taxpayers. In fact, many people have faced backlash. Many people are afraid to speak out because of that backlash, specifically journalists and editors and folks who work in media have lost their jobs over their stances for a ceasefire, um, over naming something that they see as genocide and calling it genocide. Um, so a few journalists who have lost their jobs, let's take a look at, this is nothing to do with politics or anything. But a Philadelphia 76ers uh, sports writer, J Jackson Frank, um, basically disagreed with his um, news outlet's stance when the 76ers, excuse me, when the 76ers tweeted, not the, the team stance, they, sta they tweeted, we stand with the people of Israel and join them in mourning the hundreds of innocent lives lost to terrorism at the hands of Hamas along with the hashtag stand, stand with Israel. Now, arguably that's not that crazy of a sentiment at all. Um, but he responded and just quote tweeted and said, ah, this post sucks. Solidarity with Palestine always. Frank who had only recently joined the phillyvoice.com as a sports reporter, since deleted the tweet, but he was also let go, um, which he didn't call for violence. He just said the post sucked. I mean, I guess his job is to cover the 76ers, but there's a lot more than just that. Um, other reporters have been taken off air over their social media posts. One cartoonist had their contact contract with a British newspaper terminated after penning an illustration attacking Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, um, which many thought included an anti-Semitic anti-Semitic trope. The removals follow several previous sackings at international news outlets. We know that even um, Greta Thunberg uh, reposted a post uh, that had her calling for a ceasefire and cropping out an octopus because apparently that is an anti-Semitic trope. Truly anything can be considered an anti-Semitic trope if it is taken in bad faith. We know that Ilhan Omar has had that also um, levied at her. Um, it doesn't stop there. The editor in chief of a life and science academic journal Eli Michael Eisen quote tweeted The Onion and said, The Onion speaks with more courage, insight, and moral clarity than the leaders of every academic institution put together. I wish there was an Onion University. Ten, uh, ten days later, I have been informed that I am being replaced as the editor in chief of Eli for retweeting an Onion piece that calls out the indifference to the lives of Palestinian civilians. That, that headline was, Dying Gazans criticized for not using last words to condemn Hamas. It is satirical, it is it is searing. And the fact that he got fired over it means maybe he was uh, onto something. Um, then finally, um, Creative Arts Agency, CAA um, talent agency uh, fired or what forced one of their top agents in Hollywood, Maha Dakil, to resign. Um, she posted an Instagram story on Wednesday that read, you're currently learning who supports genocide. She added her own message over the reposting stating, that's the line for me. She subsequently posted a second photo that was captioned, what's more heartbreaking than witnessing genocide, witnessing the denial that genocide is happening. Um, then she was basically forced out at CAA and she was also forced to make an apology statement. I'm not gonna read that. Um, she took down her post. I think it is absolutely absurd to make someone like that apologize for something as benign as saying, can we not turn our blind eye to what is happening in front of us, to genocide? Um, but it goes on and on and on. Senator, the most recent one was a very, very important art magazine called Art Forum. Um, put out a joint letter from the writers and the staff um, condemning and calling for a ceasefire, basically saying enough is enough, let's stop the bloodshed. And the editor in chief who had been working there for I believe over a decade 
was forced to resign and other staffers resigned in solidarity with him. He says he has no regrets over that. So it is a big move, no matter where you're at and what, what field you work in. Maybe other than this job here that I have, if I didn't, I would feel fairly unsafe in condemning. Um, I mean, I would still I would still do that because I'm actually allergic to money. I don't know if anyone knows that about me. Um, but but like, you know, a lot of folks are not able to speak out and feel like they are sent being censored. Well, they are being. I mean, what happened to freedom of speech in this country is free, but only so free. And what we're seeing is that the crushing the power forces will come bear down on people who speak up and speak out in a way that they do not agree with. Uh, This is very much giving me McCarthyism vibes from the 1950s. If people are certainly students of history, uh, remember reading or studying that as a time when if you spoke out, uh, if you spoke out in that time about, you know, the Red Scare and all of that kind of stuff, your very livelihood was on the line. And you had a politician similar to how we have right now today, uh, weighing in on it, threatening people. Um, people lost their jobs, they lost their livelihoods in the same way that people are losing their jobs and their livelihoods right now. We would like to think that we have evolved a lot in the 21st century, but obviously we see that not much has changed. And as a species, as a human species, we certainly have not evolved enough uh, to overcome this moment. So it is really sad. Any and all of us are vulnerable at any given moment that what just happened to those uh, employees, the examples and that you just gave, Francesca, and there are others, that yeah. any and everybody is can be can can lose their job. Um, it also remind well, forget it. You know, I'm not gonna go. I was gonna talk about some Black History moments too, uh, but I'll, I'll put that in the parking lot for now. Let's just say that this is wrong, and if we truly are a nation where freedom of speech prevails, no one should be happy that people are being fired from their jobs for just voicing uh, a sentiment that they don't want to see innocent lives lost, and that all lives, whether they're Palestinian lives or Israeli lives matter equally. Yeah, and look, none of these statements are I support Hamas, right? I no, mean, we, we are living in a an upside down hall of mirrors where people are being told that they support terrorism and none That's of right. these people have ever either, you know, uh, cagely or outwardly said anything of the sort. Um, and this is also happening on campuses. We haven't even covered the amount of um, uh, targeting of, of student groups and the fact yeah. that Ron DeSantis is trying to make speaking out against uh, Israeli war crimes to be to be a crime on campuses. Um, this is not only you know on this is on top of this was before the war even kicked off. I believe the dozen or more states in this country that make it illegal to boycott or divest or sanction Israel or Israeli government or entities, excuse me, businesses because of the occupation. That is literally illegal, and it's being spearheaded by the right, which again. Claims to love free speech, except for when it comes to talking about Palestinians, except for when it comes about being gay, except for you know things that they don't like. Or so black. again, or black. I mean, it's you it's know, an again. abuse of power, Francesca. I mean, that if we want to sum all of this up, it is an abuse of power. People taking out full page ads against students. You know, as yeah. you just late, I think it was Harvard, a university, but just taking out full page ads against students. For the love of God. I mean, we really need to analyze this because it's this issue today. What other issue will it be tomorrow? And that's what makes this so galling is that if we allow this kind of behavior to continue without being checked, then it'll be another issue that other people care about tomorrow. It is definitely a slippery slope. And for those who are not familiar about, uh, uh, familiar of what happened in 1950s under McCarthyism, I dare you just to take a little, just a little, you don't have to go deep, but just just a superficial research on McCarthyism and the fallout and the consequences that it had to individuals and communities because people were labeled a certain way. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, to their credit, they're definitely, I mean, you know, we're not going to talk about Palestinian human rights anymore. I mean, students, whenever they get told not to talk about something, they usually stop. Yeah, they do. They obey. They <laughs> like, obey what? real well. <laughs> It'll go over real well. They'll they'll stop looking into it. They'll stop learning. 
obviously a lot of people are finding out about what's going on through social media because of the ways that mainstream news has been one sided or has not covered what is happening on the ground with Gazans um, who are living under a hellfire amount of missiles, um, if not hellfire missiles themselves. Um, it's not actually good. Interesting when you look at uh, the tech companies and who are responsible for giving us a lot of this news, turns out they also have a bias as well. Uh, one of the largest media companies in Europe was pushing its own initiative to limit online news about civilian casualties in Palestine. That's organizations called Upday. It's the largest news aggregator app in Europe, handed down directives to color the company's coverage of the war in Gaza with pro-Israel sentiment, according to interviews with employees and internal documents obtained by The Intercept. Um, leadership at Upday, which is a subsidiary of Axel Springer, gave instructions to prioritize the Israeli perspective and minimize Palestinian civilian deaths, according to employees. Um, quote, we can't push anything involving Palestinian death tolls or casualties without information about Israel coming higher up in the story, an employee told The Intercept, referring to push notifications alerts sent to millions of phones. Axel Springer denies that. They say, no, we've not directed our journalists to ignore civilian casualties, nor have we asked our editors to manipulate news coverage, nor was corporate management, yada, yada, yada. Why, why would journalists lie about this? Like, why? Why wouldn't they, why they're speaking out anonymously? Uh, but it's not just that. Um, looking at Meta, right, owners of Facebook and Instagram, uh, they've been locking out certain accounts that they deem too pro-Palestinian. A popular Instagram account uh, among supporters of Palestine with more than six million followers is Eye on Palestine, and has been unable to be viewed since Wednesday night. The backup account was also unavailable to view. Both accounts were still unavailable at lunchtime on Thursday. This was last week. The account regularly posts images and videos from Gaza and is one of the leading. Instagram accounts sharing experiences of Palestinian people living under Israeli bombardment of Gaza. Um, this is also after, and I don't know if you guys missed this, but Instagram apologized because, oh, guess what? They were adding the word terrorist to Palestinian user profiles, which said it was caused by a bug. The issue arose when user trans, users translated bios that had the word Palestinian written in English on their phone. Profile. The Palestinian flag emoji and the word Alhamdulillah written in Arabic would be which would be auto translated to English to read praise be to God. Then it continued, Palestinian terrorists are fighting for their freedom. So Meta just added terrorists to an Arabic phrase that did not have an, an, a flag emoji of Palestine that did not say terrorists. So they, they said sorry, but it is just proof guys that like even social media where a lot of us are getting our information and, and especially in the middle of a blackout imposed likely by Israel on the people of Gaza. Even those platforms are not safe and they are not fair. And I don't know, Senator, I just, I'm getting like, when do we democratize our media and specifically our social media like vibes? Like, like can we all just go to blue sky? I know you're a very avid blue sky poster. You can't yeah. lie to this audience. We see you on blue sky. No, <laughs> I mean, I am on blue sky. There's a reason, you know? I'm definitely having a WTF moment. I know I can't say the full word, but I want people to say it out loud in their, in their workplace, at their home. But this truly is a WTF moment. What the F is wrong with us? And I mean us as human beings. We cannot turn a blind eye to the horrors going on over in the Middle East. And for people who are purely championing peace and the pr preservation of life, what is, I, I, Francesca, I, for the life of it, I really do need somebody to walk me through this. Explain this to me like I'm a five year old. You know, there was a movie, Philadelphia, that Denzel Washington starred in along with Tom mm -hmm. Hanks, an extraordinary mm -hmm. movie, I must say. But Denzel played an attorney and he would often say, explain this to me like I'm a five year old. I need somebody or a group of somebodies to explain to me why advocating for the preservation of life, whether again, it's Palestinian lives or Israeli lives, but particularly Palestinian lives, asking for their lives to be preserved is what seems to get people in trouble. What is wrong with that? And what is wrong with us? And when you have media outlets, whether they're social or mainstream, doing what they're doing, we are really in trouble because media is supposed to be above all of that. It's supposed to be the place where people can go and get unfettered access to the real. And that is the good, the bad, and the ugly of what is happening anywhere in the world. So again, it's happening now on this issue. What other issues will it happen about? 
That yeah. is the real threat. I mean, what we're talking about now is a threat, but there are threats beyond this threat. So, Francesca, I am having an absolutely WTF moment. I right mean, it's now. interesting, right? Because you imagine you compare it to the BLM moment. You know, you compare it to the the yeah. filming of George Floyd's murder. Like, imagine if. Um, during that time, Meta decided we are going to block. And I know some of those accounts actually were blocked, but like that we're just gonna black out whatever happens under BLM. No, 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 we're done with it. We're gonna cut off the internet to, you know, places like Kenosha or whatnot, like where, you know, things are going down. No more internet for y'all. No more filming of police. Police are in cahoots with local governments to cut the internet off so that you don't do not see the crimes that they are carrying out. You do not see what they are doing. Because these demonstrators must be stopped. I mean, that's and I again, I I don't mean to make a crass comparison, but I do think sometimes comparisons are important to understand it if it happened to us. And I think the answer, sadly, to your question is because they are Arabs and because because they are largely Muslims, and yeah. that is why that is why we are being being gaslit. Absolute Anywho. power corrupts absolutely. I know Michael has has the break. Absolute power, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, corrupts. Absolutely. An update about the mass shooting in Maine. On Saturday, police announced that the shooter had been found and was dead after an apparent self-inflicted gun wound, apparent suicide. Robert R. Card, 40 years old, was found dead on Friday evening from a self-inflicted gunshot. Police said Friday night, the announcement after a 48 hour search for the suspect in the most lethal act of firearms violence in the state's history brought a sense of relief to Lewiston and other South Southern Maine communities plunged into a virtual lockdown during the manhunt. Officials said they recovered a rifle and cards abandoned white Subaru and two guns with his body. All of the weapons were apparently purchased by card legally, a representative for the US Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives said. Officials have not yet offered a possible motive for the violence, though Sao Shook elaborated, I believe that's a police chief, elaborated on a note that police previously said was found at Card's house. They said it was addressed by the suspect to a loved one and listed a passcode to Card's phone and bank account information. Still not really an indicator of the why. Um, 18 people again were killed, 13 were wounded. Three of those wounded are continue to be in critical condition, at least as of Saturday. This was the scene outside of the Basilica of St. Pete's and Paul during a vigil in Lewiston, Maine this weekend. Just truly wrecking this entire community. I think we have a little bit of footage from that as well. But you know, this is on top of an incredibly deadly weekend, sadly. I mean, it's not just Lewiston. Uh, it just happens to be the biggest body count for, um, you know, sorry for the very crass term. But there have been more shootings over this Halloween weekend. Um, in fact, six people were killed and over 40 were injured over the weekend in multiple shootings in Texas. Three people were killed and three others were injured at a party in a room at a business uh, in the block of, of the 700 block in State Line Avenue. Um, apparently, it all started when a fist fight broke out between two men at the party. At least two men pulled out rifles and started shooting. Three people no longer are living. Indianapolis, a woman was killed and eight other people were shot at a large party. Again, um, uh, more than 100 people were at the event. Police responded to shots being fired and people running. Tampa, Florida, two people were killed and 18 were injured in a shooting at the Ybor City neighborhood during the Halloween celebrations. Again, a fight broke out, 3 a.m., and shots were fired. Chicago, several people attending a Halloween party in North Lawndale neighborhood when a fight broke out. One person began shooting around 1.15 a.m. A total of 15 people, ages 26 to 53, were shot and taken to hospitals. Two of them, a 26-year-old woman and a 48-year-old man, are still in critical conditions, according to the Chicago police. We have a gun violence problem in this country, and it doesn't always look the way it looked in Maine. It happens when there is a fight at a party, because fights at parties happen. But fights at parties don't usually end in people losing their lives in escalating to the point of pulling out a gun. And again, this suspect who killed 18 people in men in Maine, excuse me, he was a firearms instructor. So yeah, it is a glorification of guns. It is the ease at which we obtain them. We have more on guns in the United States, but Senator, your thoughts? I mean, 
it's rare that we, and I'm so glad we go over the number of shootings that we don't talk about because it's like, ah, oh, that it's only three people dead. Oh, it's a, it was a fight. It wasn't just like, it's almost like if they don't have a manifesto, you know, or it's, you know, it's not heinous enough. We just kind of washes over us. And that's so sad because we, it, it's every single day. Yeah, it is. It's chilling again. And the whole notion that you have folks out there who continue, even with all this bloodletting on a regular basis, we have more mass shootings than most, you know, in, in, in a weekend than most, uh, some countries have in a whole year or multiple years. And that should alarm each and every one of us. But still, Frances, whether it's mass shootings at, at, elementary schools, to mass shootings in grocery stores, to mass shootings in clubs, you name the place. We still find ourselves having this debate about the gun, the the gun obsession here in the United States of America. And elected officials, again, not taking the requisite actions from a policy perspective. But then even beyond that, Francesca, I believe that in this country, we need to have a type of family meeting over this <laughs> obsession, this, I mean, how, how are we gonna label this? It, it's, it's total gun Worship. insanity. Yeah, it's a cult. Yeah, it is, there it is, it really is. I, we see the problem and the problem is it, it's us, it is us. Yeah, and we'll see, you know, we know that one representative from Maine did apologize for uh, blocking a um, assault weapons ban. Um, We'll see if he reverses his tune and gets to work under a new Congress. Let's end with this, guys. New Speaker Mike Johnson uh, is a weird religious anti-gay zealot, but he has a plan to keep the government open. I know, surprising, I didn't know Republicans wanted the government open, but will it work? Um, he uh, last, uh, last week, excuse me, he sent a letter to his colleagues and Johnson laid out an aggressive timeline to pass individual funding bills. He wrote that if another stopgap measure is needed to extend government funding beyond the November 17th deadline, I would propose a measure that expires on January 15th or April, or April 15th based on what can what can obtain conference consensus to ensure the Senate cannot jam the House with a Christmas omnibus. In other words, I'm gonna do a continuing resolution without calling it continuing resolution. In other words, I'm gonna keep funding the government, but I'm not gonna call it keep funding the government. Um, And he's hoping that, again, we're just punting, kicking the ball down the road a little bit um, and hoping that maybe Republicans will get on board and that November 17th shutdown deadline can be averted. Um, Recall that McCarthy's rivals claimed they opposed a continuing resolution to keep the government open, offering instead a right wing government funding bill full of cuts and extraneous policy considerations that the Senate and President Joe Biden would have to swallow or else face a government shutdown, um, which they wouldn't just acquiesce to you. Um, what's interesting about this new bid is that he's probably going to need Democrats to to sign this continuing resolution. The new speaker is gonna need Democrats to vote to keep the government open. And then he's gonna have to make sure that the Republicans don't get mad at him, that he relied on Democrats to keep the government open. You see what we're doing or trying to not do or the needle we're threading. So what's gonna happen? Um, Many Republicans are likely to vote against the continuing resolution, but as long as they don't retaliate against Johnson for leaning on some Democratic votes to pass it, Congress will be good in good shape to avert the shutdown on November 17th. Again, if Matt Gates doesn't sort of, you know, wake up on the wrong side of the bed and is like, I vote to vacate, motion to vacate. Um, Marjorie Green said, I didn't vote for any of the CRs before, so that's not what I'm interested in. Uh, and Matt Gates said, and this is interesting, Senator, I think Mike Johnson has a lot more credibility that a bridge would be a bridge to a single subject spending bills, not a bridge to just the old ways of Washington that empowered McCarthy's lobbyist donors. Now, so it sounds like Gates maybe will give Mike Johnson the benefit of the doubt. It also sounds like we're gonna go, what, like a new budget bill by new budget bill by new like single subject spending bills. Does this not seem like a really ineffective way to pass a government budget? So that's gonna take forever with these fools, with these fools. Anyway, give me your thoughts on, um, it seems like they're giving him a little bit of grace, this new yeah. speaker. Well, Matt Gates understands he don't wanna totally overplay his hand. I mean, he didn't threw that, that, that grenade already. 
uh, doing it back to back like this. I think for him, it's a calculus, not that he certainly has found religion, but it's a strategic <laughs> calculus not to do the newly minted speaker this way so soon. Right. But make no mistake about it. This foundation within the GOP is on sand. It's on sinking sand. Yeah. It's being held together by a thread and barely a thread. And it could change at any moment. But Matt, Matt Gates is doing what's right for Matt, Matt Gates. And it is not the time to, 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 to pull what he put on McCarthy uh, just yet. Francesca. So that's why he just kind of, you know, stepping back now to the point of that you just made about how we run in this government. <laughs> they got one job, just one. And they can't even do this right. And this is even before the nuclear so called nuclear type option of the new uh, GOP caucus. I'm talking about years and years. We can they continue to have continuing resolutions to run the government of America. Do you understand this? These fools wouldn't know how to set up a budget that could last the entire budget cycle if it was sitting in the chair next to them. And we should all be disturbed that this is how governance is going on in the United States and that this is not new. It's been happening even before we got to this dire moment. It really is a damn shame. It's gonna be very interesting also to see them try to like pass things like taking away food stamps and any kind of, um, you know, again, uh, nutrition assistance during the holidays. That's gonna be, that's just gonna be cute. You know, I'm just like interested in that, you know, um, for the pure Ebenezer factor of it all. Uh, one of the things, of course, is aid to Ukraine. Um, and it seems like, again, hard line Republicans do not want any more money going to Ukraine, but they do want tons of money going to Israel. Problem is President Biden is putting before them a bill that lumps them together, money for Israel and money for Ukraine. Um, I think us progressives would have a different thought about how we want to separate that out. But McConnell, uh, Mitch McConnell said he wants to keep military aid to Ukraine and Israel tied together because he views those conflicts as part of, of a larger global threat. Johnson says he wants to bifurcate the issues of Ukraine and Israel. And he signaled early support for a stopgap funding bill that would include steep cuts to non-defense spending, which Democrats say would have no chance of passing the Senate. Again, remember when they're proposing all these general cuts, for some reason, the Department of Defense is like, oh no, you get carved out. You get like a little, you get a, you know, sort of a get out of uh, cuts free pass. You get a hall pass. Um, which is just so cruel. Um, Johnson, however, seems like maybe, and this was according to a new interview that he did with uh, Sean Hannity, may, that he doesn't oppose supporting the war in Ukraine. He heartened some Republicans uh, when he told Fox News host Sean Hannity that we, quote, can't allow Putin to prevail in Ukraine. So that's very different from other Republicans who are like, mm, Putin seems chill. Uh, he echoed McConnell's argument that Putin's aggression threatens the rest of Europe and that failing to stop Russia would be probably encourage and empower China to perhaps make a move on Taiwan. So, and, and he's not quite MAGA, 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 MAGA. Nina, he's he McConnell MAGA McConnell. He's he's got he's got a little bit of a dance going on here, um, and you can hear that in the ways that he is again sort of a neocon, um, you know, ratcheting up anti-China stuff, um, and then also again supporting this the, the more money to Ukraine. Whereas I truly believe most of the Republican Party has been bought by the Russian government, if not overtly. Through multiple dark money sources, but final thoughts on this. I mean, geopolitical considerations are important. We should be having those debates. But where I want to center this conversation, where they never are able to seem to come together, is to help the American people domestically. I wish that they thought highly of re reinstating the enhanced child tax credit or giving people in this country paid and family medical leave or having Medicare for all, all of those things that help keep tranquility Mm. in these United States of America. Francesca, that is what galls me, that they can't come together for those kinds of things, but they certainly can come together to enhance the military industrial complex, which ultimately doesn't get any of us anywhere if it is played out to its ultimate end, which right. is destruction. You know, don't look up comes to mind too. A big shout out to David Sirota on on that. I, I don't. I just. I don't. I don't get it. Why can't we cancel uh, cancel a student debt? And you know, U.S. Secretary Janet Yellen. I'm never going to forget it and let let them live this down. She said, "Oh yeah, 
We can afford it. We can afford it. We Two can wars. Afford it. Oh, baby. For any of that neoliberal and 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 neo fascism crew who always ask the question, "How are we gonna pay for it?" That is gonna be the quote of the century for me, Francesca. Yes. I'm always I'm just keep pulling out what what U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said. It's we a can meme at this. Two wars. Like we gotta memify this, you know. Yeah, it's we just do. Like, hey, uh, healthcare, we can afford we it. Can afford you know, it. that's it. That's we got to take our break. If you are in linear, this is it. Uh, thank you for joining us. But there is more in the aftermath on YouTube. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.